Um, and I would say from my own perspective and from my own work and also the work that my co-director, Brinton Likes, who, who is also joining us today, have been doing, there are a few subjects, maybe no subjects, that illustrate these tensions and these powerful, compelling claims more viscerally than deportation um, as it exists in the United States and as it exists um, around the world. Um, I always say to my students that the thing that's fascinating to me about teaching deportation and immigration law is that this is the moment where you meet the state at the absolute maximum of its power and authority, and you meet the individual frequently at the absolute minimum of her power and authority. Um, a person who is not a citizen, who may be outside their homeland, who has undergone a desperate journey, or maybe who's been living in another country and then is suddenly facing the prospect of being torn from it by a system that is often arbitrary and often brutal and harsh. And so this makes it a very compelling human rights subject. And so today we're going to um, view a video of about uh, 30 minutes, uh, which is called Exiled. And it is about one particular example of this type of harsh system as it has affected um, US veterans, uh, which may surprise people to know that veterans like anybody else can be subject to deportation from the United States. And we'll see what that has meant and how it's played out. Um, after that, I'll introduce Professor Mike Wishney and he's going to offer some remarks about this and about work that he has been doing at uh, the Yale Clinic where he teaches and in his life more generally with his students and with colleagues and with other lawyers. Then we'll have plenty of time, I hope, for a good question and answer session. Um, I want to um, tell people how that's going to work, just so you know. First of all, um, under Massachusetts law, we have to tell you whenever a thing is being recorded, uh, and this is being recorded. However, we're not actually recording you. So as an attendee, we, do, we will not be recording you at all unless somehow you appear on the screen, which is unlikely. Um, you can send in questions, and please do send in questions using the Q&A function. Um, you should have access to that and do it during the film or, you know, if anything strikes your interest. And I know that I have many of my students I can see who's here. Um, so you may have questions that even, even, you know, go a little beyond what the film is, but that's fine. And we have lots of other people. I see we have academics and lawyers and student undergraduate students. So everybody is welcome to ask their questions and uh, they will be answered uh, if we have time for that. And I believe that we will. Um, and Mike knows the answer to all questions, so um, I, I have great confidence in his ability to, to do that. Um, I think the only other thing I wanted to say was yeah, use the Q&A function, and um, you should have sound on this video. And Tim, I think I'm going to turn it over to you now to show us the video, which, as I say, will go about 30 minutes, and then we'll come back and rejoin for questions, comments, or thoughts. Thank you all very much. Um, hold tight and we'll start the video. All right. I hardly know where to begin. I, I, I hadn't seen that film and um, I just find myself thinking, you know, I, I've devoted almost my entire legal career to defending deportation cases, challenging the deportation system, and still I can't get used to it. I mean, I, I just think that many of us are asking the same question. How is this even possible? What, what does this country gain by doing this? You know, particularly people who have already, as one of them put it, paid their debt to society. And, and leaving aside the, the Kafka-esque intersection of one bureaucracy, deportation, which is so efficient at doing what it wants to do, and another bureaucracy, the VA, which is so inefficient at actually helping people. It's just a remarkable moment there. And I, I was just I'm struck by so many things in this film, in this video. Um, but I just keep coming back to the question, why do we do this? What do we gain as a country by deporting these guys? Well, let me turn it over to Mike Wishney to talk about that. I really can't think of a better person to engage in this discussion with. And let me also remind people that if you have questions or comments, please do submit them in the Q&A function and I will try to address them in the order in which they um, appear. Mike's gonna talk for a few minutes about the film and the background issues. Um, Mike Wishney is the 
William O. Douglas, clinical professor of law and counselor to the dean at Yale Law School, where he directs or co-directs the Worker and Immigrant Rights Advocacy Clinic, the Veterans Legal Services Clinic, and the Peter Gruber Rule of Law Clinic. His teaching, scholarship, and law practice have focused on immigration, labor and employment, habeas corpus, civil rights, government transparency, voting rights, democracy, and veterans law. And together with his students, he's represented many low-wage workers, immigrants, and veterans in federal, state, and administrative litigation, and if I may say so, in some of the most creative and energetic and inspiring ways that I know. So I'm really honored to have him here. He and his students have also represented unions, churches, veterans groups, and grassroots organizations in a range of media, legislative, community, and education matters. Um, Mike, let me just turn it over to you because I feel like there's so much to say about this and I would just welcome your thoughts and then we'll hear what others want to say or maybe you and I can go back and forth a little bit before that. Um, sure. Well, um, thank you uh, so much, Dan, um, for that introduction in this event and to Tim um, for all of your hard work to make it happen and everyone at the center uh, and to the filmmakers um, and to the participants uh, and Hector Barajas, perhaps most of all, who um, has led the fight for so many deported veterans uh, and established the house that you saw on, on screen. Um, I, I guess I have sort of three things in mind to do and then to kind of move into conversation and questions. Um, the first is to pick up with the question you started with, Dan, which is, you know, why are we doing this? Why is this even happening? How is this happening? Second, to talk a little bit about um, some of the strategies that uh, lawyers and advocates and activists are pursuing on behalf of deported veterans and other veterans who are still here but are in the middle of deportation proceedings and so at risk of uh, being deported. And then finally end with maybe some larger questions that uh, this film and the experience of the people that portrays um, might suggest for, uh, for us all to be grappling with. Um, so just three things. So first, why is this happening? How is this happening? Well, uh, at a basic level, um, as the comments along the way in the film showed, uh, first, it is not a condition that one be a United States citizen to serve in the armed forces. Um, that's a tradition that goes back to the Revolutionary War. Um, our armed forces have always depended significantly on the participation of people who didn't hold US citizenship. Uh, in fact, green card holders, legal permanent residents are required to register with selective service um, and to be available for conscription in the draft um, as one of their requirements. And, um, and it is the case, as was mentioned in the film, that uh, many people who enter the military uh, and do not have citizenship have the belief that they will automatically become a citizen by virtue of their military service. And that's not a crazy belief. Uh, in part, as you heard, um, recruiters have often said exactly that. Um, and uh, whether it's a, a, you know, a sort of a, an unintentional slip or an intentional part of a recruitment strategy, it is the case that um, many of the veterans that, that I and my students have represented and worked with over the years, reported a very similar story. The recruiter told me if I joined up, I'd automatically become a citizen. So there's a pretty widespread belief that by joining the military, you become a citizen, but that's not true. There is still the requirement to go through the formal legal process called naturalization uh, that anyone must go through. And while there are certain advantages of going through that process um, as someone in the military or a veteran that is certain requirements are eased or relaxed for those who've served. Um, nevertheless, one is not exempted from that process. One still must apply to naturalize and be naturalized. But many people who serve in the armed forces um, believe they have become a citizen when in fact they have not gone through the paper process that's required. Now, Many people who serve uh, in the armed forces struggle when they re-enter civilian life. And that can be true for those who serve in combat, but also many who don't serve in combat. For one reason or another, the transition from the military environment to the civilian environment can be very difficult. And um, 
it is the case that many former service members end up in contact with the criminal justice system. They end up being arrested, uh, being charged, and being convicted. And of course, that is disproportionately so for veterans of color um, who are particularly targeted by criminal justice systems around the country. So it's not surprising that many service members um, end up with some criminal history afterwards. Um, many struggle with undiagnosed PTSD, as you saw in the film, um, undiagnosed traumatic brain injuries, um, uh, and other kinds of things. Uh, there's a lot of self-medication through substances that can lead to uh, criminal history, and that in turn can lead people to be swept up in the deportation system. Now for a fairly long period of time, um, veterans were not immune from deportation, but there were various internal agency checks that made it a little bit less likely. And so sub-regulatory documents, operations instructions and, and local rules tended to discourage INS and then ICE from targeting veterans. And if a veteran came into their um, custody or on their radar, required kind of a higher level sign-offs and approvals before the agency proceeded to uh, launch deportation proceedings. But um, in recent years, those have generally been swept away. And so the internal agency checks that again, didn't prohibit the deportation of veterans, but tended to limit them, um, even only because it required more paperwork and bureaucracy. And so if you're a busy immigration agent looking to swiftly deport people, it just takes more work to deport a veteran. That had been the case. But with the removal of those constraints, um, deportation of veterans probably increased. I say probably because there is not very good data. Um, I think the immigration agencies have probably resisted tracking this because they know it will be an unflattering statistic. And so while in very recent years, there've been efforts to better document the numbers of veterans swept up in the system, uh, it's very hard to baseline that uh, historically because the agency I think did not want to draw attention to uh, its deportation practices involving veterans. Nevertheless, it seems almost certain that the removal of the internal controls combined with the intense focus on increasing numbers um, of arresting, detaining, and deporting ever higher numbers of people, particularly those who con came into contact with the criminal justice system, a trend that intensified under the Obama administration, um, has led to increased deportations of veterans. So you might say still, but now it's in the news. This film was made in 2017, I believe. Um, and um, for some years, there have been some efforts to dramatize the problem. Why wouldn't the politics of the deportation of veterans mean that Congress would act? You, you saw a mention of bills. Uh, isn't this a left-right issue? Democrats and Republicans alike could agree that, you know, at least in all but the most extreme cases, perhaps, uh, deportation of veterans should be deprioritized or even outright banned. Well, the political reality is that um, bills have been introduced to do that at least since the late 1990s. Um, and I say that because I know my students at NYU when I was teaching there at the time drafted a bill that was introduced in 1999. So I know they go back at least that far. Um, and in my experience, it's actually been the Democrats, not the Republicans, who have blocked all of these bills, um, not because they think that veterans should be deported more than others, but um, there's been a the, the conventional wisdom on the Hill for many years has been to resist all piecemeal immigration legislation in favor of what used to be called comprehensive immigration legislation. And the Democrats were historically afraid that if they let bits and pieces go through, the consensus in the Congress would mostly be around enforcement and detention and other um, negative measures. And there'd be very little consensus around positive measures. And so it was just typically democratic leadership that refused to let the various bills that have been introduced to benefit veterans at risk of deportation or had been deported. It was generally democratic leadership in the House and Senate that prevented hearings uh, or advancing any of those bills. And the bill that was mentioned, um, I don't believe uh, was enacted. And it was one of uh, several in the last few years, um, often with bipartisan sponsorship at the start that have failed. So the politics have been such that the Republicans have not been eager to do anything really to um, ameliorate the deportation system and the Democrats have not wanted to let 
a consensus bill that might benefit only a small number of people such as uh, this go through. And so the logjam of the politics has meant that no legislation has eased the risk here. Um, uh, one other thing to say on the policy questions before turning to practices, strat legal strategies um, to address this. Um, you also heard mention, and, and Dan, you referred to it as well, of the intersecting system of the, the uh, US Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA. Um, and the VA provides uh, a wide range of benefits for those who served um, and who were discharged honorably, as you heard um, Baraha say, for instance. Um, and those include disability benefits, which is cash payments, monthly cash payments, um, up to about $3,000 per month, tax-free for someone who is uh, wholly disabled, um, as well as education benefits, health benefits, and tragically, burial benefits, which arose at the end. And the only benefit that the VA makes easy to makes easier to obtain uh, for people who are deported are burial benefits. Um, and so many deported veterans say they, they kicked me out um, and they'll only bring me back in a coffin to bury me in a military cemetery. But eligibility remains. People are eligible for health care and disability benefits. It's just extremely difficult to access them. And you saw lawyers um, from Swords to Plowshares, which is a terrific veterans legal services organization in San Francisco who in the film went down to Tijuana to do intakes and try to assist people. And you saw the difficulties that they were encountering, the, just the bureaucracy really. So that all sounds pretty hard. Um, so what uh, are advocates and lawyers trying to do on behalf of deported veterans like the ones that you just saw in the film and, and thousands of others? Well, there's no single strategy. Um, uh, and I wanna briefly tell a story of a, a another deported veteran and a, a client whose students in the clinic here represented over several years, um, who will, I think kind of further exemplifies some of these themes and some of these strategies. So a man named Arnold Giamarco, um, who came to the United States when he was four years old in 1960 from Italy um, and uh, joined the army right out of high school in Hartford, uh, served honorably in the army, then went into the army national guard and continued his service for a number of years. Along the way, uh, his sergeant at one point said to him, you know, you really should get naturalized. You do have to file paperwork uh, and walked him down to the office to do so. And he did in 1982, uh, began the naturalization process, filed his application. Um, nothing really happened with it. The agency kind of ignored it as they were doing uh, with a lot of applications at the time, actually. Um, Eventually, he left the service, and like many, he struggled uh, in civilian life, and he developed a substance abuse problem, um, and he had a string of low-level possessory drug convictions, um, 25, almost 30 convictions. Eventually, he, uh, Mr. Giamarco, sobered up, straightened uh, out his life, began to work consistently, married, started a family, um, and was building a life. But in the push to get the numbers up that I mentioned earlier during the Obama administration, one morning out of the blue, ICE came to his house, guns drawn, and arrested him in 2011 and put him into deportation proceedings based on a shoplifting conviction and some possessory drug offenses from years before. He's now living, working, it's years past his convictions and he's arrested at home, guns drawn by ICE agents. He's put into immigration detention for a year and a half. This is a story that's familiar to many people. His family exhausts their resources, um, paying a lawyer to try to represent him um, through the immigration court and the BIA. Um, and they decide not to spend any more money. There's nothing much more to fight about. And so he's deported to Italy in 2012. Um, they're hoping to save what limited resources they still have for their daughter, um, who's very uh, very young. He's deported to Italy. He's in his 50s now, his late 50s. He hasn't lived in that country for 50 years, doesn't speak Italian, has no family or connections there. Um, the next year they reached out to the clinic um, and we took his case in 2013. We pursued naturalization for him um, and uh, attempted to revive his 1982 naturalization application 30 some odd years later, um, including by filing uh, what's called a mandamus in federal court to try to force the agency to adjudicate the application. 
that um, was moving slowly um, and um, the students pursued humanitarian parole, which was also mentioned in the film, um, a discretionary um, authority that the government has. Um, but the Obama administration had no interest in granting him parole and, and denied uh, two or I can't remember, maybe three different applications. He pursued a pardon. Uh, he actually did that on his own before we became involved. He had pursued a pardon with um, the Connecticut Pardon Board, which was denied. He did have a long history. Um, at some point, the students came up with another one of those creative theories that uh, Dan, you and I know our students are, uh, are so good at developing. And um, the students persuaded the Judiciary Committee in the state legislature, the Connecticut State Legislature, to hold a hearing on the impact of uh, deportation practices for Connecticut families. Um, and to go further and to issue a subpoena for the testimony of our client, that is to issue a legislative subpoena to bring him back to Connecticut to testify before the committee in the state legislature. Um, we asked ICE to let our client return to give that testimony. I said, uh, no, they weren't that polite, but uh, there are some other words that they said too, but they said no. Um, and uh, we went back to federal court uh, with a petition for a writ of habeas corpus ad testificandum, uh, habeas corpus to bring him in to testify. Um, the district court denied the habeas and went to the second circuit, which also, uh, which affirmed the denial. But meanwhile, the same district court judge decided that actually that naturalization application was still alive. It had just never been acted on in since 1982. And she ordered Department of Homeland Security to adjudicate the naturalization application 30 some odd years later. That led to an extremely complicated set of challenges for the agency. What rules were they under? Were they using 1982 rules or 2016, 2017 rules? And eventually the combined pressure, I think of these various legal proceedings and the media attention, the political pressure um, led the agency to come back and propose that if he were to submit a new naturalization application, um, the agency, and this is now CIS, Citizenship and Immigration Services would stipulate that none of his convictions were aggravated felonies under a novel theory that one student developed late one night um, after the Mathis decision came down from the Supreme Court. Um, a recent case on the very complicated area of crim im and uh, um, how you categorize state criminal offenses under the immigration laws. Um, this in turn led, uh, this, this deal was struck and in 2017, under the Trump administration, um, he submitted a new naturalization application and the US Embassy in Rome scheduled him for a quick interview. Um, and two students along uh, with the clinical fellow at the time, um, I, I asked him to go over and it's hardship duty to go to Rome, but uh, he went. Uh, and with the students accompanied our client who was approved for citizenship um, and um, that day and sworn in as a US citizen that day. And seven days later with a US passport, five years after he'd been deported, we met him at JFK with his family, uh, his wife, his daughter uh, and cousins and, and others. The, um, that happy story reflects just how difficult it is and the kinds of tools that advocates have had to resort to. Pardons, uh, parole applications, um, naturalization, trying to revive old arguments from years before. The point is that there's no easy clear path. There is no get out of jail free card for veterans. There's no single pathway that is available to veterans. Hector Barajas, who is the um, sort of featured uh, particularly in the film and was the lead organizer of the Deported Veterans App, um, organization and, and founded the house in Tijuana. Uh, as you may know, uh, a year after this film, he received a pardon from governor, uh, the governor of California and that um, allowed him to naturalize and return home. And so Mr. Barajas has, uh, did come back in 2018, I believe to California having had to pursue the same kind of Hail Mary strategies of pardons and, and naturalization for veterans. Um, let me end um, with just a few of the larger questions that I think um, this film and the experience of veterans in the deportation system raises. 
The first is to me, the, these cases in this film poses in a very stark and direct way, um, the question of who should stay and who must go. Um, the myth of the good immigrant and the bad immigrant seems to me exploded by the experience of people who voluntarily step forward. And whether they serve in combat or not, they step forward and say, I'm willing to put my body in the service of the nation. I, I'm stepping forward and I'm taking that oath and I'm serving. Um, it's hard to imagine a greater sacrifice than that. Um, and yet somehow in this good, bad calculus, it washes out. Um, the idea, as President Obama put it, that we should deport felons but not families seems to me completely undermined by the stories of people who are both. Um, uh, life is complicated and these easy categories um, seem to break down um, and so obviously so in the experience of veterans and particularly some of the uh, stories you saw in the film um, who did serve and committed criminal offenses and were sentenced and convicted for those. But the idea that we somehow can sort the good from the bad, the felons from the families, seems to me utterly bankrupt. Um, in a way, I think it raises the question of should veterans even receive special treatment at all? I reported earlier that there are there are special provisions in the immigration law that make it a little bit easier to naturalize and, and in other ways. Um, don't exempt veterans from deportation or, or the general burdens of uh, making application for things like naturalization. Um, but should there be special treatment, if, uh, if we are weighing the good and the bad and the equities of a case somehow, should military service count? We know who serves in the military uh, and, who, and why people choose to serve in the military. And should we be crediting those who make that choice as opposed to those who don't? Um, I'm not sure. Um, and if, um, if we reject the effort to divide good and bad immigrant felony and family, sort of what then? Um, to me, and, and this is now Dan squarely in your territory, to me, I've always kind of thought there's three big questions in immigration. Who do we admit to the country? Who do we deport from within the country? And who do we allow to become permanent citizens to naturalize? And to me, the answers have actually always been pretty straightforward. We should be admitting almost everybody who wants to come. We should be deporting almost nobody, no matter what they do. And we should be admitting to citizenship almost everybody who wants to. Um, but if we're going to reject the kind of good, bad dichotomies, how do we determine these big questions? And then finally, um, I think this film raises the question of uh, a very different kind of question of how one engages in organizing and collective mobilizations in extremis, in the most harsh circumstances. Deported veterans are not a physical community. Uh, it's individuals scattered around the globe, often with very limited means and very desperate situations. And yet somehow they found a way to engage in Tijuana, at least in some form of organizing and collective political action that eventually brought the attention of lawyers, of media, of elected officials, um, and brought relief to at least some individuals and attention to a wider set of problems. What, if anything, does this teach us about the challenges of organizing around, among deportees or, uh, or detainees or others in impossible circumstances and yet find a way collectively to express some form of resistance and some vision of a different way? Um, uh, these are big questions. Um, I, uh, I really grateful for the opportunity to be in this conversation in a way it's it's probably appropriate too because really dan this is all your fault um when the giamarco family first reached out to me years ago um you had already started the post-deportation human rights project at bc a time when no one thought there was such a thing as post-deportation you got deported the the world was over and you had the vision to launch even the notion that there was something called post-deportation and that there might be a post-deportation law practice um, and advocacy campaigns to bring people home. Um, and it was only because uh, I was aware of your work and had been to some of your events that it occurred to me to even try to find a way home for Arnold Giamarco. Um, and I'm so glad that, that, uh, that we did and that you inspired us to do that. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's very kind of you to say that. I, I was thinking about that and thinking about how we knew that these cases were going to be incredibly difficult. And, and for me, of course, the great motivating factor was 
the idea that the government should not be able to just deport its mistakes into a black hole in which there was no law. I mean, I, th that was just such a corrosive, unacceptable idea. But of course, as you know, um, the difficulties are, are just so daunting. I mean, we had a case a couple of years ago of a trying to bring back a guy who was a green card holder. We did, couldn't get him naturalized, but had been deported for a drug offense, you know, single offense, and he shouldn't have been deported. And just to get him back, took years of litigation up and down from the Fifth Circuit. And, you know, we roughly tried to calculate at one point if these lawyers had been charging, if we had been charging for our time and the firm, Nixon Peabody, had been charging for its time and it was partner's time and associate's time and innumerable students' time and my time and all the people who worked in the, the, this deportation center, you know, I thought we're talking three to five million dollars, you know, for a single case easily. And that's just one case. So this methodology is so compelling for the families. I mean, there's not, I can only imagine what it felt like to meet that guy at the airport, to feel like, you know, you remember that your whole life, that, that you actually accomplished something just amazing and beautiful and wonderful. And yet there are 10,000 other people more or less like that, more than 10,000. You know, we, we estimated there were many tens of thousands of people who had been long-term legal residents, not veterans, but people with, you know, almost equally compelling equities. And that always brings me back to the question to, you know, it's just to pick it up from where you left it off. Uh, why do we deport people? Why do we do this? This is not inevitable. This wasn't even normal through most of the history of this country to say with no time limitation for even drug offenses and relatively minor things and no possibility of relief or forgiveness or, you know, going before a judge and pleading your case or, or having a judge look at your family or your history, and, you know, balance these things in any way. This is relatively recent. And what's so odd about it is the president who signed the laws, as you well know, you know, who that facilitated this was Bill Clinton. And so the, the legacy of the Democrats and the Republicans is complicated. And I agree with you about the Obama administration, although I always have to say in this context that the stuff that happened during the Trump administration was so far beyond the pale. I mean, we moved from a brutal, harsh system to actual crimes against humanity, I, I think, you know, in, in the Trump administration, that, that's a big step. But I remember a, apropos of the Democrat thing, you know, we I was working for some years on trying to get a bill through to, um, regularize the status of the living descendants of non-citizens who had been killed in the World Trade Tower you know, in, in, on September 11th. And we had exactly the same experience. The Republicans were fine with it. And the Democratic said, no, that's the tip of the spear. If you cut off the tip of the spear, you don't have a spear. And I mean, I can understand that in a real politique mode, but it seems to be, hap it happens again and again and again. And there is another theory, which I think you're beginning, you know, you were sort of hinting at, and I tend to agree with, which is let's save wherever we can. And maybe little by little, it'll become apparent that we shouldn't be deporting people under these circumstances. And, you know, if you look around the world, this is not typical. I mean, in Europe, it's sort of garden variety law, human rights law, that if you're going to deport a long term resident for crime, some adjudicator has to balance these things, has to, you know, have a hearing in which you say, yeah, what he did was bad, but he's also got two kids and, he, you know, he, he had a, uh, a substance problem. You know, all these things get taken into account. Well, let me uh, push my students a little more and those who are watching this to, to ask us some questions. We can't um, force it, uh, but we had one which I think you kind of answered, which is, is there any update on the proposed house bill they introduced in the film? And I think you said there isn't as far as you know, and there certainly isn't as far as I know. Yeah, I, I believe that that bill, and there were several around that time, um, were all introduced, some with bipartisan sponsors from the start, um, but they did not advance um, uh, either in the House or in the Senate. The one I mentioned that my students wrote back in 1999 started on the Senate side um, and uh, it did not advance. And I'm not aware of any current, um, you know, plan to to move something forward um, with any prospects that are any better. No, and and I think we've all gotten quite cynical about this. I, I remember being in Guatemala. I probably told you this story before, but because it's kind of embarrassing in retrospect, being in Guatemala in 2008 and talking to people, some who had been deported and some who were planning to make that dreadfully dangerous trip north 
about US immigration and deportation policies and saying to them, you know, there's this guy, Obama, who's running for president and he's a child of immigrants and biracial. And, you know, I really think the system is gonna change if he gets elected, although who really thought he was gonna get elected. But, and, and then actually what we saw, as you said, was pretty harsh enforcement. And I don't think a Biden administration Personally, I'd be interested in your thoughts about this, but I don't anticipate that a Biden administration or even a Kamala Harris administration will be much different in that regard. And even comprehensive immigration reform. I mean, there was this Fix 96 movement that was alive for a while. I, I'd be surprised if we see that happening. Although the ethos of the you know, Black Lives Matter and the, you know, challenging the criminal justice system movements do seem to hold some promise if you expand that logic to this system. But what do you think about that when you're looking forward? Um, I mean, on the one hand, I'm always optimistic at some like mid to long-term <laughs> um, horizon, um, but no, I quite agree in the short term, I'm not at all optimistic. Um, the, I mean, you can already see the Biden-Harris kind of transition focus on four areas. Um, it, you can't, and none of which could you argue with, um, and you can't do everything at once. And so they have to make choices, but those four areas as they've articulated them are COVID, economic recovery, racial justice, and climate change. Well, there's nothing I would take off that list, of course, but immigration isn't on there. And um, that's already a signal that, you know, the Rahm Emanuel comment at the start of the Obama administration, that immigration is the last two years of the second term. Of course, by then, Obama had lost the Congress and, um, you know, Biden's not even starting with the Senate, it seems, yeah. unless we all moved to Georgia. Um, uh, so it seems uh, improbable that certainly for the next two years and probably the next four years that there'll even be a serious effort by the Biden administration um, let alone accomplishment. And to me, that's why, and this is a bit of what the first question I see is getting at, I can appreciate the political logic, and I don't sit where you know Chuck Schumer sits. Um, that one might have said at some point, you know, there's a lot of serious talk about comprehensive reform. We've got some bipartisan stuff underway. Let's not risk undermining that with a piecemeal approach. Um, but then a year later, two years later, five years later, ten years later, fifteen years later, at some point you have to say, you know what, we can do the we can do the Dream Act. We can do TPS. Mm -hmm. We can do deported veterans. Like there's things that we can do that um, we're not going to hold up everything else for. And it's it's excruciating. And uh, you know, Dan, you and I are old enough to remember 06, 07, 13. Uh, there were a lot of bad deals that were struck. Like the deal, the co the comprehensive reform deals were not very good deals from a progressive perspective. And yet they were the best that could be had at the time. And there was a lot of tension about whether to get behind a not so great deal that had lots more enforcement and detention and stuff um, uh, in exchange for some relief for some people. Um, and in the end, they didn't go through anyhow. But to me, I guess I, I had became much less tolerant of the idea of delaying piecemeal progress uh, for the prospect of some sweeping bill um, as time went on. And I'm now, uh, I just think uh, we've been in such hard circumstances for so long that if there's consensus on a piece that's positive, you know, it should, it should move. But do I predict anything big? No, I would love to be wrong. I mean, the last time I don't know what you think, but the last time I was thought there could be something really big was when Bush too was elected. And I thought maybe it's a Nixon goes to China moment where a border state Republican, you know, might have more room to kind of operate than a Democrat who's always worried about being seen as soft on crime and law and order and, and kind of you know, trying to secure that flank. Um, it's reductive to even talk about it that way, but I remember the excitement that as terrible as the Bush, you know, uh, Gore outcome was from that moment until 9-11, there was some thought that there might be a serious immigration effort that could go. Um, so yeah, George I, W. Bush would have would have signed off on that. I mean, he lost, he didn't have enough political capital and enough authority behind it to push it when, once the right wing mobilized against it. That was a lost opportunity. And with Obama, of course, so much political capital was spent on health care that they, they just didn't have anything left. And I don't think they want to do it. I mean, I, re I remember we have colleagues, you know, who served in the Clinton administration who used to say that the word that always came down was whatever you do, don't get to the left of Congress on immigration. You know, as, as the administration, they just don't want to be in that spot. It's just too, too toxic. 
too hot. And now I, what demoralizes me is we've, as a nation, we've just sort of gotten used to the idea that this is normal, deporting hundreds of thousands of people per year for ever minor, more minor criminal offenses with no balancing, and then dealing with the consequences to their children, to their spouses, their families left behind, which probably costs a lot more, you know, that, that is part of the question, why do we do this? Like, what do we actually gain from this? When they've served their time already, you know, they've given everything back that they needed to. Anyway, we do now have some questions, and I think you were kind of answering the first one, if I understood you correctly. Do you want to just go through them? I mean, you can read them as well as I will sure. say these are my absolutely most brilliant students, three of them here, I recognize their names, and my favorite student, anonymous attendee, who um, I think attends many of my classes, has also asked a question. But do you want to, you want to just go through them yourself? Uh, sure. Um, so the first one's about humanitarian parole, um, which um, can be open-ended and indefinite, though uh, Rena Parikh was in the call earlier. I'm not sure if she's still here. She will certainly correct me. Uh, no one knows more that I know about parole than Rena does, um, Professor Parikh. But um, uh, it is it is potentially open ended. It is not necessarily time limited like certain visas. However, it can be revoked at any time, essentially for any reason. So parole um, can last a very long time, but it's very precarious, um, and it does not allow one uh, in almost any situation to adjust into a more stable status. You're kind of locked in largely at a very precarious status. Well, let me say that has varied actually historically. I think there have been moments when we've been able to adjust people off of parole, but in most recent years, it's, it's basically been blocked. But because um, the fiction is they're not really here. That's right. the thing that we let them here, but they're not really here as a legal fiction. Um, the next question is, um, do courts have any agency in interfering with the deportation of veterans or is formal legislation our only option? So there is judicial review of removal orders. Um, but um, if the immigration laws don't allow for any basis to resist the removal order, that is, yes, you're not a US citizen, you agree, yes, you were convicted in this court of this offense. Um, and because of the way the immigration laws are structured so as to make one ineligible for the forms of immigration relief that do exist from asylum to what's called cancellation, then there's often almost nothing for the courts themselves to review. So you could go to the court, but there's nothing for them to review because the removal order does in fact comply with the immigration laws. Um, yeah, the only thing you know, we've tried to do, as you know, in some of these cases is, for example, I was just teaching this in class today and this student knows it, so I'll mention it. If you have somebody, for example, who took a plea, but wasn't advised properly by their lawyer, or if, if, the, if it turns out that it was a, a substance that was not on the federal list, you know, you can find some defect, then there are mechanisms. And, and the court has been opening the door little by little to things like equitable tolling and, you know, being able to go in even years later for certain types of cases to revisit some of these really harsh deportation orders. But man, it's a long, hard slog in all these cases. There's so many roadblocks and impediments. It's so legally complicated to do. Right. And what you're getting at, of course, Dan, is the there are possibilities of attacking the underlying criminal conviction if there was some defect um, through state habeas or uh, other forms of collateral attack. Um, but if the underlying conviction itself is valid and it does align with the immigration statutes, then the availability of judicial review of deportation orders in and of itself doesn't give anything uh, uh, meaningful to, um, to veterans. Right. Um, are VA cash benefits considered public benefits under the public charge rule? Could they affect the naturalization process of veterans still in the US? That's a good question. And you would think I would know that off the top of my head. Um, uh, I believe that uh, they are uh, not a problem under, under the public charge rule. Under um, the Trump, I, I would ask the anonymous attendee because we were just having a class on this. Under the Trump public charge will maybe be different from the way they've been historically considered. And I think you're right historically, but these days, you know, well, well, I'm treating the rule as enjoined by Judge Feinerman. Yeah, right, right, right. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you uh, to my college classmate, Gary, for that one. Um, the um, uh, could VA benefits, VA cash benefits are uh, understood essentially as something like workers' compensation. They are compensation for wage loss based on injury in the workplace um, and in injuries incurred at work. Um, and so they're in the nature of lost wages. Um, and I yeah. think that's the... the conception of them. Yeah. Um, I don't see how they could affect naturalization anyway. 
if the person already has a green card, because the, the public charge stuff is usually the problem of going from not having status to going to, you know, adjusting status or something. If a person already has a green card and then they take benefits, they're not typically going to be deported for that unless it's something that happens fairly recently after they got the status. Mm -hmm. um, any chance to pass different legislation to stop this going forward um, to make this uh, naturalization automatic with joining the military? Again, um, my my own experience, which is certainly not all of the bills every year round, uh, has been on the immigration side. No, but actually, this is a useful question to me. It's prompting something. Um, so, something that I, uh, I learned from another former student, Becca Heller, who runs the International Refugee Assistance Project, um, which began as the Iraqi Refugee Assistance Project. Um, I, and has done amazing work, by the way. I mean, that's yeah, she's really, really incredible. Uh, for sure. And um, Becca realized and IRAP realized that while immigration bills go nowhere in Congress, every year Congress passes a defense budget, the National mm -hmm. Defense Authorization Act, and they persuaded um, Armed Services Committee staffers in House and Senate that treating, you know, interpreters and uh, for Iraqi Afghan soldiers and so forth um, as a defense measure rather than immigration measure would allow for amendment. And so they have several times gotten amendments essentially to the immigration statutes through the National Defense Authorization Act on the view that this is really about national defense. Um, and it never occurred to me until this question from Steve Levy that we ought to be doing the same thing. That is, there, we, there ought to be amendments proposed to the NDAA um, to benefit veterans facing deportation who have been deported or, for instance, yeah. making naturalization more automatic uh, than it is now. And as, as Steve knows, I think there are fast track naturalization programs for people who serve, particularly if it's a time of armed conflict, but that doesn't solve the problem of them being deportable in the interim. It's not an automatic thing. Right. And even when you try, as the case of Mr. Giammarco, so he did serve during, he because he served in the army in the 70s before the end of the Vietnam War. He didn't deploy to Vietnam, but he's, he served during a time of armed conflict. He then made his application while he was in the National Guard um, and should have been the beneficiary of all of that. And yet, um, more than 30 years later, they hadn't gotten to his file yet. So, uh, and there were hearings in Congress in the 80s, we learned about this later, about backlogs uh, of naturalization applications and kind of lost files and stuff. So he was presumably not singled out. He was just one of tens of thousands who um, the agency simply fell behind on his naturalization applications and just kind of threw them out, actually. Um, and uh, so um, even when you have those fast track things available, and sometimes even when you try to access them, they, they don't always um, uh, operate in reality as they're set out on paper. Yeah, and let me mention something which is which I know, of course, you know, and, and it's sort of implicit in everything we said, but I just want to be explicit about it. For these kinds of deportations, there's no statute of limitations. So that, you know, you could be talking about a conviction that goes back God knows how many years. And for any other criminal charge, any federal criminal charge, virtually all federal criminal charges, except for the most serious terrorism type things, it's like a five year statute of limitations for criminal prosecution in the federal system. And here we have nothing, you know, you're, you're, it's eternal risk for, for the discretions of youth that often are not that dissimilar from what our last three presidents have admitted publicly that they did, you know, and they, they managed to overcome it, but there's no forgiveness in this system. There's not, and the sword hangs over your head every day. You know, parents who get up in the morning and get their kids to school and go to work just don't know if today's the day that someone's going to show up and handcuff me out of the blue, um, as happened to G. Marco, as happens to so many people. Just the threat, that possibility, and the, the psychological distress that that causes in households and for you know parents and, and, and their children are aware of it too, that just, as you say, it never, ever goes away. Um, it's unrelenting. And... Uh, you know, statute of limitations for immigration offenses, extending registry, the, the, these ideas are there. Um, but uh, to the last question, um, you know, about a tipping point, um, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, I do think immigration is already less toxic. I think that the, a lot of the 
uh, I don't even want to say the word poll because polls have such a bad rap again, but a lot of the public opinion surveys during this election cycle suggested that people supported more immigration and, and you know, the support for immigration was uh, much higher than it has been in recent years. And it, it ceased to be quite the wedge issue that Trump made it in 2016. And I think it's not happenstance that that just wasn't the central plank of his campaign speeches. Um, he also recognized that he had kind of lost some of the public debate on immigration. Um, that doesn't mean Congress will therefore act. I mean, McConnell has lost the debate on so many things, but is quite content to not act. So um, I, I don't know what it will take to unstick Congress um, and to actually have the kind of substantive rewrite and updating. I mean, Dan, as you know, the laws were last meaningfully revised in 96, um, and it's already been a generation um, uh, since then. And even then, we were kind of working off the 1952 Act with important you know, amendments in 1980 and 1986, but really we're working with an immigration framework that goes back decades and is not at all appropriate, in, in my view, certainly to the modern economy, modern trade, modern families, modern human migration. Um, we're just working with these very outdated statutes that we literally can't find a way to, um, to update. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think you have to disaggregate the two, the two sides of the question. One is the, the, eco the need for workers is one thing, and that's a sort of economic and, and driven by business interests. And that ebbs and flows. And, and the more they need more workers, then you get that pressure to open up the system a little bit. But that doesn't necessarily, as you said, translate into a more humane deportation or exclusion policy, because you can take a totally instrumentalist approach to wanting workers and say, yeah, let's bring in more workers and let's give them as few rights as possible. I mean, look at Kuwait or Saudi Arabia or many other countries that are like that. So I think it's interesting to ask the question of why didn't we have harsh deportation laws of the type that we have now? in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, why is this a relatively recent phenomenon? And I think it does dovetail with some of the racial politics of the time and the, and the, 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 the mandatory drug laws and so forth. And it's just interesting that much of that debate hasn't really filtered into the immigration sphere yet. You know, the people are, even Trump is saying, you know, he wants to let people out from these long mandatory drug sentences, but he doesn't want to bring back deportees, I can assure you of that. So this is sort of the last bastion of that. And I think uh, it's very hard to imagine what the coalition will be uh, that's going to organize around that issue. I mean, these, these people have very little in the way of a constituency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, they're lost that way. It's just you and me. And I mean, you know, like, you know, try to run for office on the platform of the rights of criminal aliens need to be better protected. I mean, you know, that's not a winning platform in this or any other country. And yet in many other countries in Europe and in Canada and throughout most of the, the Western hemisphere, in fact, the laws are more protective because it's a general principle of human rights law. Like we don't sort of segregate out the deportation from the criminal system. Because another question that a student might well ask, and we'll talk about in class next week, I say to my students, is why isn't this double jeopardy? You know, how can it be that a person is criminally prosecuted, serves their time, and then they get deported for the very same offense for which they were prosecuted? Well, that's not a crazy notion. And actually, in many legal systems, it is considered double jeopardy, and they don't do it. So, you know, there's all these, there are many kinds of arguments. Anyway, on that note, I'll give you the last word, Mike, and then um, we, we will be uh, done for this. I, before I forget, we owe you food. We owe you a dinner. You know, you can call um, in this chip as soon as the as soon as that Pfizer vaccine goes into your <laughs> arm and my arm, we'll, we'll take you out to dinner. But I'm I'm looking forward to it. Well, I was going to say something about Europe, but I, I don't want to end on that note. I'll just say thank you so much for having me and for um for this film and for this event and for goodness sake, you heard us. We stumped each other on how to get out of it. So to the the students of of Dan's and of my own and whoever else is on the phone, um, we haven't figured it out. We're counting on you to find a way through because we have to, we have no choice. We, as a society, as a nation, um, as, as caring, loving people and community, we have to find a way through. So we're looking to you for that. Don't mourn, organize. I'll leave it at that. Joe Hill. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Okay. Excellent Thanks, Dan. Thank easy. you, Tim. Bye. Bye.